much. I'm glad you've enjoyed the opening chit-chat with your neighbours here this afternoon. A uh, few technical hitches like we sometimes have, but hopefully the boys have sorted it all for us. And I'd like to welcome Sarah, who's come today from Swansea. She developed a course called A Gourmet's Guide to History, which covers seven main historical periods. Today, she's going to tell us about the trials and tribulations of keeping Wales fed during the years of the Second World War. Sarah. Thank you very, very much for inviting me here today. As I said, I run a course called Gourmet's Guide to History with our local U3A. I've been doing talks for a long time on food and history. I, start, I went on a course years ago and I got hooked. I've done workshops, I've done online courses at Reading University, you name it, loads of things. But since we've moved back to Wales, I have done several things related to Wales particularly. I have written a book which Swans U3 published booklet called uh, Coastal Foods of Wales, a history, and there is so much for me still to learn. But of course, the main thing is, with a subject like this, a lot of you will know more than I do. Where do we learn about this? We're lucky enough to still have people around who can tell us. So several of these uh, bits that I'm going to tell you today are from friends and things that happened to them during the war, things that happened to family. I did ask my father when he was still alive, well, what did you eat during the war, Pa? <laughs> Bad move, he said. Oh, when I was at university, I got a barrel of wine, a, a beer a week delivered. I said, yes, but what did you eat, Dad? He said, no, can't remember. I said, well, you got married during the war. What did you have for the wedding breakfast? He said, we managed to get a case of Chateau Ikem. <laughs> I said, yes, but what did you eat? I said, OK, I know that the V2s came over Southampton, so you had to go to Cookham, to Bell and the Dragon, for your honeymoon. What did you eat? He said, the food was wonderful. I thought, at last, he said. Do you know, he said, behind the bar, they had a row of bottles, and we worked our way from the left right through to the right. I never discovered what my father ate during the war. Anyway, we will start... Let's go over here. Oh, well, we've got memories. Have I got the right one? Oh, yeah, sorry. That is us now. Should have done that one before. I do apologize. All of you, as I say, will have memories. They may be yours. They may be families. They may be friends. But we all fortunately have them. My other talks, I can't ask for that. None of you will remember back to medieval times. But this you do, which is great. So, the next bit. Some of you may have been evacuees. I'm sure many of you will know people who were evacuees. And because of London and major cities being bombed, a lot of people were evacuated to Wales. Uh, Mrs. E. A. Hemming of Great King Street, Hockley in Birmingham, wrote to the picture post. She said, my son, just six years old, has been evacuated to Monmouth in South Wales. I went to see him on Sunday, and I can't really express my gratitude and how much I appreciate the kindness shown to him and myself in the wonderful way in which we were welcomed. I didn't think there was so much kindness in this world. If you could see the smiling faces in Monmouth, it would do you a world of good. The order to evacuate children was given on the 31st of August, so three days before outbreak of war. And over the following week, almost one, two million people, most of them children, were sent away from their families in the industrial cities, as I said, of the southeast and the middle, Midlands and a lot into Wales. Not all were treated well. My friend Mavis went to a vicarage where they would give her the apple cores 
after they'd eaten the apples. She was not happy, and it did affect her for life, I have to say. But there was a Liverpool lad who went to Pembrokeshire. He went to a vicarage, 25 bedroomed. He didn't go back. <laughs> His mum finally came down as well. Someone went from Swansea to Ammonford, and for five weeks they were given rolls and spring onions till mum came to collect them. And Anne from Liverpool went to Aberiron. Was the English speaking? But the great thing with children is, of course, that they adapt incredibly quickly. One of the things afterwards, rather than questions, I would love it if you told me some of your tales. And then maybe I can add them to future talks. Let's move on. We've got to decide now how to improve nutrition. Nutrition in the 30s, we've got the depression, got a lot of problems. Things are not good for people. We already knew at the end of the First World War that a great percentage of people were unfit to fight because of poor nutrition. Before the war, one third of pe people only were living above with the optimal requirements. So that means two thirds didn't make it. They thought that a feed a family of four was six to eight shillings. Many people were spending one shilling and sevenpence. I don't have to explain shillings and pence to you, which is great. <laughs> In 1939, for people from these families, calorie intake was 900 a day. But by 1944, it was 3,000. So things had improved greatly. We know that during the Depression, mothers gave up food for their children. Of course, something that we hear about happening today, sadly. Also, Germany was much better prepared than Britain because they'd been looking for some time on what might happen. And so they'd been looking for what they could grow themselves. And they were 86% self-producing. Britain was 30%. It'd be very interesting to know what we are today. What did we eat? We ate white bread, marge, jam, tea, and fried fish. That was the major diet of a great many of the population. So for the working class, rationing actually had some benefits. A woman from Monmouthshire said in 1942, we've been rationed here for years, so it's nothing new to us. People didn't feel the loss of food because they hadn't had the foods. Tin fruits and things like this were not common. Nonetheless, general shortages did significantly increase crime at this time. And the number of recorded crimes in South Wales rose by 84% between 39 and 45, with violent crimes against property rising by nearly 150%. So we didn't actually share quite as much as we think. Key nutrition dates for the time were 1940, the National Food Survey was established. 41, nutritional standards for school meals were introduced. 42, mandatory fortification of margarine with vitamins A and D began. And of course, we still add vitamins for certain foods. 44, which is an interesting one, the first food labeling order, because now we're so used to looking at what foods have, but it was 44 that came in. And also in 44, the proceedings of the Nutrition Society were published. In 1939, the Ministry of Food was set up by, I'm sure most of you will know that it was good old Lord Wilton. Hear a bit about him in a bit. 
and he, they were looking at providing an adequate diet for the people of Great Britain. It played a very important role in their lives because it was the first organization responsible for a nutritional policy in the whole of the UK. It controlled all food supplies, food reserve stocks, and the distribution of food, and had local and regional committees to give expert information and organize the use of gardens, wasteland, and allotments for producing food locally. The National Loaf was something that came out of it, if anyone remembers the National Loaf. It was a bread made from wholemeal flour with added calcium and vitamins B and nicotinic acid and introduced in 1942. It was uh, used, made from brown flour because at this time there was a shortage of white flour. There was Barra Brith, was actually still made in Wales, but it was known as Barra 1-2 because that might be the number of currants you found in it, if you were lucky. Um, Professor Priest Morgan, who I will refer to a lot in this, he wrote a wonderful article for me, which is now in the archives in Swansea. And he says that as a small child, he was encouraged to eat up every scrap, or Lord Woolton would be told. He imagined that Lord Walton lived near the Truant School in Swansea. And it was through this that our gen well, generation before and ours as being children were, grew up waste not, want not. On. So, I have to say that... <laughs> I did give it to my class once. They were not impressed at all. Didn't think much of spam. So what do we have to do? What do we need to import? We've only got producing 30% ourselves. We've still got to import, but we, don't want to Im we can't import all the things we had before. Shipping is at risk. We just need what we want. Well, let's look at kaleidoscoped meals, dried eggs, dried milk, um, Con dried and condensed milk, all those things. We'll cut back on imports of fruit, nuts, eggs, whole eggs, and animal foodstuffs. Let's start looking for ourselves. What can we give the animals? We will add vitamin A and D concentrates to oils and fats. We will have cheese, and we will have canned fatty fish. Very important. Keep hearing that word fat in your minds. Uh, foods that could be kaleidoscoped, I'd mentioned. The, but one of the things that did come in, apart from spam, of course, was corned beef. The American troops called it, when on bread, they called it shit on a brick. <laughs> spam sandwiches did become a wartime staple. Someone said they had it in every form you could think of. And strangely, they still loved it. There was uh, American canned meat, fish, tin fruit, dried peas, kaleidoscope again, breakfast cereal, suet. Tomorrow I'm doing a talk on one of my course, Gourmet's Guide to History, which will be on World War II. And I'll be doing a sea pie, which has a suet topping. So that was important. And jellies, they did give meals some variety and flavour, though there wasn't that much of it. American canned pork was a novelty in Britain, and sausage meat was very popular. Tin might cost 16 points, remember you're buying in points, but it was worth it because it contained fat, and fat was really important for cooking because there wasn't a lot of it. If you just think how much you use in the way of oils, butter, whatever, we do use quite a lot of it. Um, even after the war, tin food continued to be popular. And if you think now, we deliver to the food bank every week. It's all tin food that we take up there. But one of the problems was the US had promised to give us a certain amount of this tin food. And then they started planning themselves 
for 43 when they were going to introduce rationing. So they started, they thought, no, they've got quite enough. They're making a fuss about nothing. Well, we were getting really desperate because they halved the amount of food they were giving us. And it wasn't until we managed to get in touch with Harry Hopkins, who was Rothschild, not Rothschilds, <laughs> Roosevelt second in command, that we managed to up it again. And to everyone's great relief. Well, if they decide on the food, we have to decide on what you can bring into the house yourself. I've got these. I love the story of this. One of the things that people would have as sweets, children, this is Priest Morgan again telling me, were Collis Brown's tablets. Does any, has anyone ever heard of them? Well, it, apparently you ate them and it gave you a wonderful feeling, nice burning feeling, you felt really good. And it wasn't until after the war they discovered that they were half cannabis and half opium. <laughs> so they did go down very well. Uh, they thought they needed a basal diet, the base food you would need. It's interesting because all of us on our low-carb diets now, it consisted of one pound of potatoes, 12 ounces of bread, only six ounces of vegetables, two ounces of oatmeal, one ounce of fat, and just over half a pint of milk per day. No meat. The idea that was that this would form the basis of everyone's <coughs> daily diet and other items would be surplus to their nutritional requirement. It, what is interesting is at the same time, the Germans in Paris were working out the minimal requirement that people would work without rising up. So they could still work, but they couldn't revolt against the Nazis. In 1936, as war clouds gathered over Europe again, the government set up the Food Defence Plans Department, and they began stockpiling sugar and wheat and thinking about rationing. And they encouraged people to set up their own food stores. My grandmother was a great one, actually both grandmothers, for filling pantries, we still had pantries, with loads and loads of bottled fruits, whatever. Leaflets were sent out. They're very keen on leaflets at this time, saying how you could store food at home. And the emphasis was on tinned food. But there were also people who were also asked to get sacks of flour, sacks of sugar, sack, boxes of tea, things like this. They issued a leaflet called Home Storage of Food. And it made lists of food from five shillings, ten shillings, and one pound, according to your income. This is what you could have in the house, along with menus and recipes. Uh, I, in addition to what I've mentioned before, there was coffee, baby and invalid foods, and dried fruit on these lists. To be kept in metal containers, no plastic, with tightly fitting lids. The, nation, uh, the booklet suggested that at the event of war, the nation would be immediately rationed. And of course, not quite immediately, but not soon after. Have a think, what would you actually stockpile today? It'd be interesting to ask different generations what they'd stockpile. Have a think about it. People hoarded their own foods too, of course. My friend Jean, her parents went out and bought goats. She said she never wanted her goat's milk again after the war. Peggy's father came home with a huge sack of flour, and apparently Peggy told me that this lasted her the entire war. My grandmother had sugar. Um, and this lovely tale of Lord Denever, who went to see Mrs. Peel at Taliaris and asked for sugar in his tea. She opened a cupboard door and it was so tightly packed with sugar, it all collapsed over the floor. Um, not many sweets or chocolates, so of course you could always have your Collis Browns. Um, but there's licorice root, there was Spanish licorice, things like this you could still get. You could swap food. Uh, Priests' neighbors, 
didn't like ham or bacon, wonderful. So they gave their coupons to his parents. They also gave lovely ideas. Having got all these tins of things, you could turn them into a poof by covering them with a bit of knitting, whatever. Uh, Professor Priest Jones, uh, sorry, not Priest Jones, Professor Jones was head of uh, the Department of Mining at Swansea University, and he had friends in Australia who said, look, can you tell us about families so that we can send tinned food to fruit to them? So he was a go-between for tinned fruit. There's also the story of Uncle Albert. I'm sure this is apocryphal. People got terribly bored with what they were eating. They wanted more flavour. So, one day, from Australia, they get these, what they think are spices. Little packet from Australia. So, they spend the week adding it to the food. And at the end of the week, they get another letter from Australia saying, I hope you got Uncle Albert's ashes, <laughs> and where he wanted him buried. <laughs> When you got leftovers, you got bins in the streets, of course, to feed your pigs. You, many of you will have seen Coal House at War, which was a wonderful series a few years ago, with the pig when it was finally called. My father was saying that his father's company kept a pig. You were only allowed half. There's half of the company, the other half would go to the Ministry of Food. Chickens, of course, and bees. Uh, Betty, member of U3 in Swansea, she, her parents kept fish, chickens. Fish, you could only have two eggs per person a week if you kept them yourself. But that, of course, didn't happen. Her brother was in the RAF, and her mother said, when they came round with eggs in the house, I can always give the buggers omelettes. Like others, they turned their allotment over from flowers to veg. Betty also remembers sitting in the tea bar, plucking the chickens. Uh, rations were used to make cakes for special occasions. Wedding cakes were often cardboard with a tiny little cake inside. In fact, today I was turning out a cupboard and I found my parents' wedding, the decoration that went on top of their wedding cake. Um, we, they did, they reused and reused and reused food. Someone said that we ate leftovers so often we'd forgotten what the original meal was. I think we may be doing that again sometimes. Stale bread. I don't know about you, but I keep all my stale bread, freeze it and use it for other things. I use it for breadcrumbs, but I don't know how many people still do that. Yes, nothing was wasted. I actually read someone in the, in the paper said, how mean can you be to put tomato sauce upside down in the fridge? And I thought, not that mean, just sensible. <laughs> uh, if you've got rabbits or you were near wild rabbits, you could have rabbit stew, rook pie. Never really fancied that. Homemade wine. Uh, one tale which doesn't refer, really refer to this, but our next door neighbour, Mary, one Christmas they all had oranges at the bottom of their stockings, which their father had got for them. Only trouble was they were Seville oranges. So let's get on. Uh, need to grow our own. And we're back to Priest. Priest says he remembers visiting Ninian Road in Cardiff, the recreation ground, in 1939, and found it be given over to allotments and tool sheds to dig for victory. In Swansea, sorry, I'm not terribly sure about Porthcawl, Cumdonkin, Victoria Gardens, the castle, around the castle in Oystermouth, Sketty Park, and Home Farm Singleton were all dug up for allotments. Maybe some of you know where they dug up here. And on to having grown everything, of course, we can move on to the black market. I'll start with my mother. My mother was in Barts in London training. And every week, she would send her laundry home to Sandovery on the train. Every week, it would come back, and between the laundry, there'd be cheese, there'd be butter, there'd be eggs, all the other things, all black market. Uh, John Francis, up the road from us, had an aunt who used to look after hams for the local butcher. 
But when the local butcher would come, they'd say, oh, well, we haven't got it all, and maggots got the rest. Exactly. Uh, friend Judith, you three remember, she said that a uh, lorry overturned at Langevelach Road. By the time the lorry driver got back, it was full of eggs, by the time the lorry driver got back, no eggs visible. But in spite of what we think, the black market was mainly about swapping clothes, clothes very important, and buying eggs. There wasn't that much more. Wales had more petrol checks than England. Not quite sure why. I suppose maybe with Milford Haven, there was more petrol available. If there was sugar, you'd hear about it immediately fallen off the back of a lorry, and they said that pheasants fell out of trees as well. You might have your spiv around, your suspected person, an itinerant vegan, vagrant selling various things. People did fear the food inspectors. They punished food hoarding and any black market trading. They'd stop cars coming into Glamorgan from West Wales and search their boots. And there was a checkpoint at Morriston Cross to stop those travelling east from Carmarthen. There, another tale, this was from Priest again, possibly apocryphal, a civil servant who accepted bribes of salmon and meat was stopped at Morriston Cross and said, I'm going to make a clean breast of it, officer. In my boot, I have several salmon, chickens and a dozen pheasants and several fine hams. And the policeman, of course, thought, it wasn't true, and just said, oh, get on with it, and off they drove. Rationing was severe, but neighbours swapped and bartered with each other for fresh vegetables, sugar, and other luxury items. People would often queue outside shops without actually knowing what they were queuing for. And as late as 45, Priest was on holiday in Dinas near Fishguard, when he said there were rumours that black marketeers were hanging around the backs of hotels offering salmon, trout and other goodies. Betty, another WR, not U3A member, said her neighbour turned her front room into a small shop and sold peanut butter, which the GIs loved, little knowing that, of course, it had come from the PX originally, nicked by other GIs. In fact, uh, deserters and troops were a major source of appropriation, shall we say, nicking food. So we need to grow some of this food. My friend Joyce, um, they actually, one of the things they, because they needed so many more land army girls, they built special places for them to live. And in the village next to us, they built prefabs. And um, she said that every day while she was a land army girl, she had beetroot sandwiches. That's all she had for the five years of the war. They, not all land army girls, although they might have served in Wales, came from Wales. Delith, on the market's mum, Swansea Market, she was a land girl in England. But one night she went on the razzle with her friends. They were called up separated, and she was sent off to Pembrokeshire, where she met her future husband. So, what's a happy ending? They did an amazing number of jobs, planting, picking vegetables, milking, both during and after the war, they did that. Dorothy Mellon from Cumbran was a land army girl from the age of 16. They couldn't join till they were 17, but she lied about her age. And she worked on farms from Newport to Ross and Wye. She said, I enjoyed all of it. It was the outdoor life. The company was marvellous. The girls from Wales were fantastic. The land army girls looked after the animals. They ploughed the fields. They dug up potatoes, harvested the crops, killed the rats dug and hoed for 48 hours a week in winter and 50 hours a week in summer. As there wasn't enough machinery to go round, they often had to resort to old-fashioned methods. Uh, horse-drawn, hand-held ploughs, sometimes probably not even horse-drawn, and harvesting crops by hand. Many of them lived in the farms where they worked, but in rural areas, 
living conditions could often be very, very basic. And lifestyle, of course, could be lonely as well. Slowly, they set up hostels, as I mentioned with Joyce, to house them. And by 1944, there were 22,000 land girls living in 700 hostels. It reached its peak in 1944, when around one quarter of all land girls were employed in some form of dairy work, as opposed to on the land. Pests such as rats really did cause a major problem. They reckon there were over 50 million rats in Britain. I think it's probably more than that now, isn't it? Um, so they had to look at ways to get rid of them. And they, I think they gave uh, two land army girls managed to kill 12,000 rats between them in a year. So if you multiplied that by 22,000, they probably would have got rid of the five million. They also, they had anti-vermin squads, so foxes, rabbits and moles were all got rid of. A nice bit of misogyny. They were employed by the farmers who, um, paid, sorry, by the farmers who employed them. The minimum age was 28 shillings a week, half of which was given for board and lodging. Male workers got 38 shillings a week. So there you go. So we've got to make do the inevitable cue. Um, I went to give a talk at Merton WI, Bishopston, and someone told me that for making do in her school, they gave her mashed parsnip with banana essence for pudding. <laughs> You'd use your cookers every which way, like we're being told to now. Not just one thing in the cooker, you put lots and lots of things in. I mean, Wales had been used to doing that for centuries because the rice pudding always went in with the joint. Hay boxes we use. It. As I mentioned, tomorrow I'm doing sea pie, uh, which I have seen being cooked in a hay box at a World War II recreation. It was... It's a meat dish, but you would, what would happen was when the far, uh, sailors up in Liverpool went out to sea, they'd leave it cooking as long as they were out, because the suet crust made a lid for it. And at the end of the day, when they came home, or in the case of the soldiers, when they came back, it was perfectly cooked. And hence the name, because it was sailors' sea pie. It's nothing to do with the sea. Many farms still had old-fashioned fireplaces. If you go to St. Fagans, you can see the um, saucepans with legs that would have gone into the fire rather than having any form of cooker. Though my grandmother still had the old cooker at the side of her fire in her kitchen. And she used it. A uh, lot of the Welsh recipes didn't contain sugar, and they could be easily adapted in various ways. Uh, Krempog, Glamorgan sausages, Welsh cakes, you don't have to use all that sugar. And Priest tells me that they boil up condensed milk till it got so thick you could cut it, and they'd have it as sweets. Lovely one. Tea tablets were used to make the tea look stronger. So even if it didn't taste stronger, it looked stronger. Uh, you could add baby's dried milk, lick it off the baby, or national milk, if you could get it, and saccharine, used as a sweetener. You could use honey or jam if you were lucky to ha enough to have it. Bread was heavy and a dull grey colour. My husband's at the back, I was at the back, is a mean hand at making Doris Grant loaves, which don't use yeast, they're an, almost an instant loaf, but were very popular but they do need eating quickly. Uh, sweets, dried milk, peppermint essence, you've got a bit of sugar or icing sugar, you'd add it. Grated carrots, replace fruit in a Christmas or birthday cake. Substitute almond paste was made from ground rice or semolina, again with a little icing sugar and almond essence. Dried egg powder was used as a raising agent. And, of course, you could re, uh, reconstitute the dried egg and use it for fried egg. My friend Anthea said she loved, she'd cut a hole in the middle of a slice of bread, then she'd pour 
dried egg into the middle of it, reconstitute a dried egg, and have it as fried egg. And she said it was wonderful. She told me a lovely tale last week that she said that because she was born during the war, she once heard her parents saying, when the war ends. And she thought, what do you mean when the war ends? Isn't this it? Because she'd never known anything else. Um, government then thought had the bright idea of introducing whale meat. Yeah, completely inedible. Uh, they were really keen on pushing fish, and they thought, well, whale meat is fish and it's meat all at the same time. Fresh fish was difficult to get hold of, so they had the bright idea of combining fish and meat together and getting people to eat it. People were told how to cook it. You soaked it overnight, you steam cooked it, you soaked it again, then you blanketed it in a sauce. One member told me that they gave it, they didn't eat it, they gave it to the neighbor's cat and even that turned up its nose. <laughs> I mentioned how important spam was. The person said she ate it in sandwiches, fried with chips, cold with salad, chopped in spam and egg pies, but still enjoyed it. Priest told me his local butcher did supply sausages, but they were mostly breadcrumbs and gristle. And because of the lack of cooking fat, liquid paraffin was sometimes used instead. <laughs> oh, there's another lovely uh, WI member. I've had quite a bit of, from the WIs. Uh, her apparently, her brother would buy a Swede so they could eat it on the way home from school. So, whatever you could have, if you were hungry, you ate it. And rationing comes in. It began on the 8th of January, 1940, and the first things were bacon, butter, and sugar. By 1942, you got meat, milk, cheese, eggs, and cooking fat. As I say, this cooking fat really was so important. Uh, interestingly, the Weekly food ration, it was bacon and ham, four ounces. Other meat, equivalent to one shilling and tuppence. Butter, two ounces. Marge, cheese, two ounces. Marge, four ounces. Cooking fat, four ounces. Milk, three pints. Sugar, eight ounces. Preserves, one pound every two months. Tea, two ounces. Eggs, one fresh egg, unless you're actually producing them yourself, in which you have two, plus dried egg. And sweets, 12 ounces every four weeks. It's interesting that their sweet or collection or sugar collection is rather probably higher than a lot of ours would be today. Um, Priestess visitors were surprised to see a sugar basin on the table when they went. But in fact, they put a, his parents put a mustard spoon in it. So you could only have a tiny bit. Uh, they were pretty boring. They were plain. They were tedious wartime darts. They were introduced to new foods, like dried egg. As I mentioned, Anthea loved it. But they lost touch with old ones, like oranges and bananas. But one new 3A member's brother, Keith, father did bring a banana home. He ate the banana, and he then took the skin into school and sold it to someone there. <laughs> because of the government realizing the impact rationing would have on the morale of the people, they never rationed bread, potatoes, cigarettes, or beer. It was only after the war, of course, potatoes were rationed. It did share a, sen a sense of shared sacrifice, because everyone was in this together. It cut across class lines unless you could afford to eat out at restaurants where food was not rationed. This meant that those people who were, had money had more access to more food than others. Offal, of course, was not rationed. John from Kilvey Hill, U3A member, said that they had tripe nearly every day. Another member from Calais said members sheep's heads calves, this is a regular. And some, when we were up in Fla Liverpool, said he'd been evac his school had been evacuated to Landidno, and he always remembers the liver with the tubes still in it. If you had fruit trees, you were given a sugar allowance, so for making jams and jellies.
Yes? Yes, yes, almost food bank level. Yes, yes. So if you're in an emergency, this guy somehow probably go in for vegetables. Exactly. That shows how tightly controlled the system. Exactly. Yes, and in fact, um, they would also um, ration themselves if, you know, say to the customers, no, sorry, uh, even with your coupon, we haven't got it. So, how to cook it? Well, shag eggs. Well, you all know the major person on how to cook during the Second World War was, of course, Marguerite Patton. Um, she was a leading home economist for the Ministry of Food's Food Advice Division. And she made it her life's mission, really, to show people how, what they could cook and to be healthy. You got low fat, low sugar, but high carb, high fiber, high vegetables. Um, and it was really a pretty healthy new lifestyle. My parents' generation, and possibly ours, they reckon are going to live longer than the generation coming up because of the change in diet. The Food Advice Division, of which she was a part, travelled all over Britain, including Wales. They set up demonstrations in markets, shops, factories, canteens and welfare clinics to help people to get through. Because they wanted to match the feeling of people at home to the feeling of the forces. The forces were fighting. The home front needed to fight as well. Every day on the radio, she'd broadcast on the kitchen front and passed on her favorite recipes to the nation. And most of those favorite recipes would include potatoes. Uh, when war broke out, farmers were actually told to increase their potato production by plowing up grasslands, and the numbers increased significantly. One of the things, actually, that I haven't mentioned in this, I did mention it to the WI, was that onions at one point practically went out of existence, and they had a, a major onion growing time. She reckoned you should eat potatoes at least twice a day, because they're a fantastic form of energy in the form of carbohydrate, but they're also rich in vitamin C. So they invented Potato Pete. He had his own song, he had his own cookbook, and lots of leaflets. Cakes and pastries could be made, bulked out with potatoes, potato pastry, whatever. Um, they, you'd eat potatoes also in place of bread, because we've got them. In fact, given the choice, I think I'd go for potatoes anyway because bread used imported wheat, and you've got the vitamins, as I mentioned. Carrots, parsnips, swedes were used in a variety of recipes, and green vegetables were very important. And it had to be cooked correctly. Interestingly, at the beginning of the war, the most common cookbook in people's kitchens was Mrs. Beaton. And we all know how Mrs. Beaton told you to cook your greens. Marguerite Patton said, no, we've all got to change that. Self-raising flour would be used rather than plain because obviously it was very heavy, this plain. And herbs, grow herbs, everyone can grow those even on the windowsill for extra flavor. Most people, oh, sorry, just done this one. Oh, what I did miss was Wilton pie. Has anyone ever had Wilton pie? It is disgusting. <laughs> I have had it in various, various different people have made it. The course I run, uh, people for, are asked to do recipes for each period in history. And when we come to World War II, I say, right, go and find a World War II recipe. And they have brought back Walton pie. So I have had several variations on Walton pie. And my husband will back me up. Forget it. It is awful. Uh, <laughs> So, move on for those who can afford to eat out. But actually, most people did eat out at least once a day because they were working 
and you've now got the British restaurant. Uh, my father told me that for two courses it was ninepence, and three courses was one shilling and threepence. And food there was not rationed, but of course they did often have to ration it because they didn't have enough to go round. You can only have one bun, not two, whatever. Uh, fresh fish in the fish and chip shops, strangely, wasn't rationed. And there'd be long, long queues for fish and chips. Still served in newspaper, no washing up, we all remember that. But some foods were simply off the menu, just did not have them. And so you'd substitute foods. There was one story I read in England, someone who went to the Savoy and eating her steak said to her friend, horse, and her friend refused to eat it, so she ate hers as well. <laughs> Very sensible. Plates were smaller, much better for us. School dinners were off ration, and the government now provided free school milk for children. Very important. Uh, I mentioned the British restaurants. One reason they were so successful and could be cheap was that it was all done by volunteers. So you weren't paying anyone to do it. Plus, they used local church halls, working men's clubs, whatever. So again, you weren't pay paying for the premises. So that did make a real difference. And it was the WRVS, or WVS, there was no R in those days, who were the main workers at these places. We all remember their green uniforms. Foraging. Rosehip syrup's there for a spe very special reason. Um, the government decided they were going to go for a rosehip syrup collecting campaign. Well, why rosehip syrup? Professor Drummond, was the chief advisor on food contamination and he had a right argument with Lord Woolton because he said that we needed rosehip syrup because it's so good for you. I don't even know if they have rosehip syrup anymore. I know I had it as a child. Um, the idea was first suggested by Magnus Pike, who you might have heard of, who was then a young chemist and he said this is what we need. Drummond learned that the Ministry of Health was attempting to find a manufacturing chemist which would be able to make a syrup. So in September 1941, they launched a national campaign and around 100 tons of hips were gathered in the first year. The WI were major, major collectors of the hips. Uh, they sent out books also on foraging, Vicomte de Maudry wrote a book called They Can't Ration These. Uh, Hedgerow Harvest from the Ministry of Food. So not only rosehip syrup, there was slow and marrow jam. How to collect them. Don't just pull up a mushroom, cut it, and always leave the roots in the ground. People experimented with dandelions, nettles, and dock leaves. We are living in England then, our daughter's school during the war. It was a vegetarian school, had tried to feed the pupils grass. Didn't go down at all well. <laughs> so we're looking at what can we get. It wasn't just these things. Thousands of tons of wild plants were collected during these periods. And they used for an array of purposes, not just eating. They were used for medicine as well. And, but they did save, help save the home front from mass malnutrition. In a season, blackberries would be picked, hazelnuts, and barakausahuru, uh, bread and cheese, the, hay, hay, the hawthorn trees buds would be eaten. Priest tells me that in Timani, the house, the, part old, the old park of Timani, the house, children, young boys would go and get more hen's eggs and suck them for a quick meal. Interestingly, after the war, people gave up on foraging for quite a while. They said, no, don't want to do it anymore. And who can blame them? So, troops in Wales. Do recommend, if you want anyone to talk on this, and my friend Anthea, Anthea Simons, the one who likes the fried eggs, she does a very good talk on black GIs in Wales. And she'll be doing GIs in Wales this week, Saturday, down at, it's free, 
uh, historical association down at the waterfront in Swansea, if anyone's interested. Um, there was a US camp between Ponchlew and Groves End, uh, but of course there was black-white segregation, which we didn't approve of at all, and there was a lot of quite a lot of trouble between the British and the US troops because of this. The soldiers were very generous. The kids would go around chanting, give us some gum chum. Uh, <laughs> most of them were country lads, and they just liked to be invited to tea and things like this because they were missing home. Those were ba many based on the Gower Peninsula, and you three member Diane tells the tale of her sister seeing a soldier throw petrol over his shoulder and light it. And he boiled his billy on it and started to sing a song in a language he didn't know. When she asked him, he said, it's my birthday today and I'm singing happy birthday. He was a French Canadian with the American forces. Her sister said, it's my mother's birthday today. And the GI reached into his bag and he gave her a tin of peaches and a tin of corned beef to take home for her mum. And when she got home, her mum made a lettuce and cheese sandwich for him because apparently they didn't have much fresh vegetables. And so they were thrilled when they got them. She, Dan said how generous the soldiers were in giving out gum to the children and fig and nut bars, which they loved. Some of the villagers, not so good, did charge the GIs for sandwiches and vegetables, and often asking more because, of course, the GIs didn't recognize the currency, so they weren't always perfect. When they left, the GIs this is, Diane's brothers went down to Horton, the sand dunes at Horton, and the GIs had dug a huge great hole, and into it they were throwing all their tinned food. Her brother managed to save some, but he put the bag down it was in, and it was picked up and thrown in with the rest. And no matter how much they looked afterwards, they never managed to remember where the point was. So if anyone's got a metal detector, wants to go round, you might find it. Back to Betty. Her teacher, Miss Shepherd, got engaged to someone with the USAF, who came in and said, close your eyes for a surprise. And when they opened them, there were sweets on every desk and the largest apple Betty ever saw. Greg, also you three, a his uncle Tommy, was in Pembrokeshire. He was in a double-decker Sunderland, which had their own mini kitchen and stove. And they used to cook pork chops, liver and potatoes, and endless cups of tea. Naffy meals with steamed sausage meat pie, Lord Wilton's pie, of course, Cheese pudding, rice and cheese pudding, liver a la Francaise, uh, kidneys with mushrooms, rabbit pie, empire tart, sugarless cake, and, and various other things. But all of them would have a tot of rum before every mission so they could die happy. They did have their own cookbook, which included gravy soup. In 1944, it would have pre-war recipes, but by 1944, they had recipes that included what you had or couldn't get on ration. So they are looking at alternatives. I'm just going to end with going back a few years with what happened to Swansea Market. Because, of course, most of you will know about the Blitz in Swansea, February 1941. And Hitler had planned this before the war. And the aim of the bombers was, of course, to destroy Swansea and Victor uh, docks and the Victoria Railway Station. And they did succeed in causing devastation to the town. In fact, I remember when I was a child, most of the car parks, I think, were still bomb sites. It took a long time for them to rebuild them. The market was completely devastated, as, of course, was St. Mary's Church. But it was a vital food supply to what were then just 23,000 people of Swansea, now over 200,000. So they cleared the site and they put up a makeshift market. I was told Goat Street, but someone else tells me Union Street. So whether they work between the two, I don't know. Water had to be boiled. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, so YMCA mobile canteens were set up to supply food and cups of tea for those who were homeless. homeless. Uh, had to clear all the rubble, but they also had to maintain gas, electricity, and telephones, too. Days afterwards, they learned that 200 people had killed. Of course, this was not the only blitz on Swansea. We tend to think of this as the only one, but it was not. Um, one of the nice, well, nice stories in some ways was that someone came back to her home from London, met a, a soldier on the train, who said, oh, well, let's have a cup of coffee, tea. So they found somewhere to have a cup of tea. And then he said, well, I'll walk you home. And he walked her home, but her house was no longer there. But they got very friendly. <laughs> and they married and did live happily ever after. Thank you so much for listening to me, as usual. Actually, I've just managed the hour. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, anybody got any questions or memories? Or memories are what I want, please. Let's just Swansea Market. If we go there today, we often buy lamb bread or cockles. Were they available in the world? They would have been, because you'd have had them from North Gow, and they were local. Yeah. Yes, I'm not so sure about some of them these days of constant <coughs> pollution. No, they uh, still are, because they were actually on... TV yesterday yes, talking yeah. about Swansea Market. Yes. But it's I always a it. worry up Pen Clouds. Well, Pen Clouds. Yeah, exactly. yes. yeah, Which are sold all over the world. <laughs> Pen Cloud yes. cockles are famous yes. mm. worldwide. That's very good. Yeah. yeah, I've got a story. I had a very, very new Welsh grandfather who apparently dug up this huge garden, planted all the vegetables we had to, he had chickens, which my family had to feed. And he sold everything to the local shop, and she had to go and buy those vegetables back. Oh, <laughs> but she got the smallest of her children to creep under the chicken wire, <laughs> a few eggs now and then, and to hide them in the flower. And she managed to do that for months. But he found out, and so he went to and he put his fist in, and smashed all the eggs. So that was that. Uh, oh, the family never understood why he did that. <laughs> Anyone else? Any wonderful tales? I just share one, just, just so we could just hear it. Uh, my, my grandmother, she always wore a very black dress, and she was one of the eminent members who used to go on to the, to the church. So she had quite a good reputation in the area, so I understand uh, uh, as I grew up. But I always wondered as a boy why we were never short of butter and cheese. <laughs> and it was only later that my mother told me, she said, well, what used to happen was that your grandmother would wheel you along in your black pram when I was, say, two or three. And uh, it all started at that early age when she went to some lovely farms. This was living in the Cotswolds, where it's called Morton and Marsh. And she would walk along with the pram and uh, uh, take along uh, some beautifully uh, uh, prepared uh, tarts because she was a wonderful pastry cook. And so she would take along to meat pies and... Uh, apple pies, and in return, apparently, underneath the, the false bottom, where I was up above, but underneath was quite a wall and a various thing, and the, back came butter and cheese. And that's how we always had far more butter and cheese than anyone else. Oh, that's awesome. Anyone else? Ruth? My grandmother was an orphan, and she was his brother kept pigs. My great grandfather lived on the very top of the row on the bulk. And between them all, they never went short of anything because what they had, they bartered them with rest so that they always had eggs, they always had uh, fruit, everything they wanted. Because as a family, they stuck together and my grandmother collected stinging nettles and made mm. a beautiful stinging nettle pop. Mm. I didn't believe it until she made it for me, mm. and I thought I was I was drinking uh, just a nice uh, sort of um, mm. nice stinging um, drink.
Well, I, I do uh, nettle soup and nettle quiche, and they're both very edible. Mm. She used the sugar for nettle pop, mm. and she, she sold it at a penny a glass. Oh, wow. Mm. So the whole of the top of the Arbor Valley were intertwined with barter, more than even using money at the time. I think rural areas did a lot better than towns, I think. I can remember my auntie, we lived in Welford Avenue, my auntie taking me on the bus. We got off somewhere on the A48. I reckon it's the roundabout now before um, Tesco. And we walked down this lane and it was Trose. And her friend there had a small farm. And we went with an empty suitcase and came back with it full. <laughs> <laughs> All these honest members of the U3A. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a bit to do with food in the war, obviously. On the 3rd of June, 1940, my parents got married in Gilgill Church. And they had the reception in the in Louis Cafe, which is now along the waterfront, along the, the prom there. And it was June, so it wasn't too bad. The rationing was coming, but not too bad then. And uh, uh, Louis had, because he had a cafe, so they would get nice food and everything. So they had the wedding, they're having the wedding meal and all the rest of it. And they were looking out the window, and along the promenade, people were walking towards the railway station. And all around Porthcawl, they were congregating towards the railway station because there was an, a, a, a train coming in from Dunkirk. <laughs> for the troops who had been evacuated from Dunkirk. And they, all they, they'd been stuck on a, a train. They got off the, off the battlefront, hadn't had to do anything, got into Port Cole, disheveled, hungry, dirty. And people were coming in with, uh, with razor blades, flannels, soap and everything to, for the troops. So all the food from the reception put into <laughs> boxes and and carried down to the train for the troops. So there they arrived, all these people giving them all goody things, and a wedding breakfast. <laughs> and one of the guys happened to be coming from Fourth Call, from, from, from the Dunkirk lot. He was in whatever regiment it was. And he got off the train, all dirty and disheveled, and one of the sergeant majors from Duck Town went to, reckon, uh, went to welcome the troops. Look at this guy, Corporal. Thomas, you are disgusting, dirty <laughs> so-and-so, get your hair cut. <laughs> and then a little story, anyway. And another one, at the end, towards the end of the war, talked about bananas. Well, my uncle, Packwoods in John Street, uh, had a grocery, green groceries. And he had a delivery, Mr. F -f -f Fife's, through, uh, <laughs> through a barrier. Uh, bananas, we're arriving in South Wales. Bananas, bananas. And the word got around, but they're only very limited, because we're actually there. Uh, bananas, even in those days. So he had a couple of boxes at the back. And there he was up at the counter, and one of his old customers came in. Hey, Mr. Backwood, I think you've got bananas. <laughs> and he was very limited, and he said, Oh, no, Mrs. Thomas, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I haven't got it. And I was standing at the back. And I said, Yes, you have, Uncle Sam. <laughs> There's a big box in the get there. <laughs> 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 Let's begin. <laughs> There we are. That Jeff always has a story to make us laugh. And I'm going to ask the other Jeff to uh, return a vote of thanks. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, I was fascinated by all of this. Of course, I was too young to remember. Of course. <laughs> but uh, I have read quite a lot of history. And one of the things that amused me was uh, Churchill at some point quite late on in the war when there was a big conference of the, the Allies and Churchill that the Americans said, what, what would you like us to bring? And he asked for a crate of oranges. Mm. And, and they were cock-a-hoop with this crate of oranges. I hadn't seen them in, in years. Mm. But I, you brought the whole period alive for us. And Sarah, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs>